uh, amazing how much more IT we are now than we were four years ago. But uh, it doesn't necessarily get it either, but it's just what it is. If, um, we've been having to do a lot more with these clinical devices that would have a computer on it. Four years ago, give them up. And then all of a sudden, they just walked away from it. Okay, guys, it uh, looks like it's uh, 8.30 my time, 6.30 your time. Dustin, would you like to uh, do any sort of a, a, a kickoff here? Well, perhaps not. Am I being heard okay by everyone? Yeah, we hear you fine. Loud and clear. Okay, very good. Um, thank you for inviting me here tonight. My name is Patrick Blanch. Um, coming to you from the mountains of a uh, on a ski resort on top of a mountain in northern Virginia, where I'm up here for the Virginia Biomedical Association. Win for me. Um, thanks to Dustin for inviting me to do this presentation. I hope you find it interesting. Uh, it should take uh, approximately uh, two hours, but uh, I'm going to see if we can't rush it through a little bit uh, in respect of your time. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about Politics 2012, um, how to get along with those very powerful ho uh, department hospitals that are not, uh, those departments in your hospitals that are not your customers. Okay. Um, who am I? Well, uh, I'm a certified clinical engineer, a CBET. I've been in Biomed about 37 years. I've been very active in the certification of BMEDs and clinical engineers. I'm a member of virtually all biomedical associations because bottom line, I want to see what's going on in our profession and uh, be able to uh, impact it in some way. I'm 58 years old and getting near the end of my career and feel like I want to give back a little bit before I uh, cruise all off into the sunset end. 10 or 12 years. Uh, currently, I work for Global Medical Imaging and Sales Development. Uh, they sponsor all of my activities. Uh, I do write a daily blog at my company's website, uh, which is directed specifically at uh, biomedical technicians and clinical engineers. I would invite you to, uh, to visit that. Uh, I think I put something pretty interesting up there uh, five days a week. Um, in hospitals, hospitals have been said, and I certainly agree with this, have been said to be the most complex organization that man has ever created. It's a wonder to me that anything gets accomplished in a hospital. With so many different people, different departments, different priorities, different complex things that have to go on, the inner workings of it and the opportunities for errors and the uh, misunderstanding from one function to another is just huge. The purpose of this presentation is to help us understand some of those other very powerful departments that we work with. We're trained in biomed school to work with our customers, the ones who own the equipment. They, uh, uh, we know how to answer a service call, go up, uh, take care of their problems, fix the problem, uh, see if there's anything else we can do for them, indicate our availability for future service, and those kinds of customer service things that I think we've all been taught. Uh, but there's some other things that we never get taught, and that is how to get along in the day-to-day -day world with the materials management department, the human resources department, the IT department, accounting, and administration. Unfortunately, these, these hogs that have to work together in a hospital are occupied by people. People have egos. People have uh, power issues. They have um, their own way of looking at the world. They each have their own filters on, and they see the world in entirely different ways. Uh, let me give you a real brief story. 
Uh, once upon a time, there were six blind wise men, and they were traveling around India, and they came upon an elephant. And when they came upon this elephant, they each walked up to the elephant from a different direction, and they each touched a different part of the elephant. And uh, the one that touched his tail says, oh, an elephant's like, an elephant's like a rope. One touched his side. He says, oh, no, an elephant is like a wall. One touched his tusks and said, no, an elephant's like a spear. And they each had a different perception of this of the same exact animal. And so in today's world, um, we, we've got to be able to see things in the same way because in hospitals we are working for the same common good, and that is to get the patient cured, stable, and out of hospital. Some of the other, uh, some of the characteristics of these vital departments are they're bigger than us, the five that I just named. They're more powerful than us. They think the hospitals revolve fully around them. Their priorities are not our priorities, and they and the realities of healthcare technology management. They, they just don't. The departments we're going to talk about today are accounting, administration, human resources, IT, and materials management. We're going to take each of these in turn and examine their functions, their activities, how they view the world, how they, what sort of interactions we in healthcare technology management have with them, and we're going to try to develop strategies for succeeded for succeeding in our goals by framing our needs in ways that further their own goals. Let's get them on board with what we're trying to do and make them see that it is is, is helping them also. It's called marketing 101. Anybody in the audience who's a salesman who has ever done any kind of sales knows that you have to make something appealing to someone else for them to support it. So let's start out now with accounting. Accounting, uh, their definition is uh, the use of a system for recording and analyzing the financial transactions of a business. It's all finance. It's all about money. They see the world as dollars. Everything is dollars. Risk is dollar. Patient losing an arm is dollars. A patient death is dollars. Everything that happens is reduced to the lowest common denominator, which is dollars. And that's quite appropriate. Everything in our society does have some sort of a dollar value attached to it, and dollars are responsible for helping us stay in business, helping the hospital stay in business tomorrow. Their major functions tend to be, again, payroll, accounts receivable, accounts payable, budgeting, and financial statements. The ways that we interact with the accounting departments are that we've got to come up with every year an, an operating budget, which is funneled to accounting and which takes its cues from accounting. We have to come up with a capital budget, which is how we buy very expensive things. By the way, uh, does anyone in the audience know the difference or know why we have two different budgets in a hospital, an operating and a capital budget? Well, let me tell you. Uh, an operating budget is those expenditures that you have to make in order to keep doing tomorrow the exact same things that you did yesterday. You may do a little more of them, a little less of them, but you're going to be doing the same things tomorrow as yesterday. A capital budget, in addition to usually being the very expensive things that have different tax consequences, the real reason for a capital budget is a capital budget is 100% discretionary. No company ever has to spend anything out of its capital budget. I'll bet more than one of you in the audience has been in a hospital that has frozen their capital expenditures for a year or more. And that right there is proof positive that capital budgets do not have to be spent. That's the money that you would spend to do something different. 
you add a, a, a tower, you add a new service, you add an extra piece of equipment, you add something new. So you never have to do that unless something that's critical for your uh, operations fails, like a, an HVAC goes out and you have to replace it or, or shut down the business. But other than those emergency replacements, uh, you really never have to spend your capital dollars. Uh, we also in Biomed have to explain uh, uh, our budget deviations. Again, accounting works on dollars. They expect you to adhere to your budget, and when you're outside of your budget, they want to know why. Also, we deal with them in terms of FTEs, full-time equivalents, people. I still do not understand why FTEs are so absolutely sacred in hospitals. I've actually gone to vice presidents and said, hey, I can save you $300,000 a year this year and every year thereafter if you'll let me hire a $50,000 a year person. And they've said, no, we're on a hiring freeze. And I pull my hair out. I don't understand what the deal is with that. <clears throat> well, in talking to people, I finally figured out that FTEs are the quick and dirty ways in which hospitals compare themselves one to another. You have very high-ranking administrators in hospitals that they know that they have 4.3 nurses per uh, patient bed, and they use that to compare to another hospital. And if the other hospital has 4.2, then the one that has the lower staffing numbers is judged to be better in some way. So less is better in FTEs, and that's why there's often false economies in hospitals where they have more contracts and less in-house people working on the equipment, and that's deemed to be a good thing by some unenlightened administrators. Overtime, the use of overtime. Um, anybody ever been on an overtime freeze? Well, I think that's another one of the most ridiculous things in the world for a biomedical department because overtime, unless you're goop Unless you're goofing off and not doing your work during the day just so you can work late and earn that time and a half, which I don't think anybody's doing, overtime is required, it's necessary, and if you didn't have to, uh, uh, if you couldn't do it yourself, you'd have to pay somebody else to do it. Speaking of overtime and how much we cost a hospital, let me ask you something. Uh, I'm sorry, was someone there? Okay. Um, let's think about this. Let's think about how much we cost a hospital. Does anybody in this room make over $100,000 a year? I would expect probably not. And if, and if you do, you might not want to raise your hand because some of the other people may uh, get angry at you. But let's say everybody in the room, everybody in the audience makes $100,000 a piece. That amounts to $50 an hour. $50 an hour. Do you have any company in the world that will come in and fix your medical equipment for $50 an hour? Even $100 an hour. You're not going to find any companies that do that. And yet we do it for half that. So we've just established by this very simple math that we are the cheapest people to service medical equipment on the planet. When a hospital is in financial straits, you don't cut back on biomed, you let us do more. You, you save money by allowing us to expand and grow. And that's a concept that we need to get over uh, to both accounting and administration and human resources. The next way we interact with accounting is in the way that we our our budgets work. I hope some I hope everybody in the in the uh, audience has what I consider a consolidated budget, where you um, I think I got my terms wrong here, but a consolidated budget where you have one budget for biomed and it pays every single penny for the maintenance of every single piece of equipment in your hospital. That means every service contract, every part, every repair, every outside service, everything. 
it's only if you have control of all of the dollars in the hospital that you can control the vendors that come in and work on your equipment. You don't have a prayer in the world of having a vendor service person come in and check in every time they come in the, the department and leave you copies of their service tickets if you're not the ones paying their bill. There's just no way to get that accountability. And it's a proven fact that when Biomed is overseeing the outside service providers, service gets better and costs go down. People sharpen their pencil. They know that we are professional account or service managers and that we are able to ask those those questions. And the other way is the ways to charge back equipment costs. Uh, obviously, the cost of maintaining equipment, uh, uh, if you have a, a consolidated budget, uh, you may need to charge that back once a year so people can get it back. Because one of the one of the arguments you're going to hear from the accounting department is that we have to get the cost of maintaining the equipment back in the call centers that actually generate the revenue so that we can tell how much we're how much our total cost is for say an appendectomy or a cat scan or one of those things well you can do that through your computerized maintenance management system and do that on a monthly a quarterly or even an annual basis and charge that back you don't want to be forced to put those numbers back in the individual cost centers of the clinical departments on every single transaction. You don't have good enough control and you don't have a knowledge of the overall equipment costs. Questions or comments on that? Okay. For each of these departments, I'm going to come up with a list of 10 things that I think that every director or every person in that particular department needs to know about Biomed. What I would suggest you do is print these out, put them up on the back of the door going out of the Biomed shop, and let your technicians, yourself and your, your, your other employees, read this thing and prepare what they want those departments to know about Biomed. I would even sit down at a department meeting and take these 10 things, maybe the 10 things that accounting needs to know, and have make that a topic of discussion at a department meeting. And practice how you would get that across to them. Debate whether it's true or not, whether they need to know it, and how you would get that message across. Uh, has anybody here ever heard of an elevator speech? I'll bet if you're a salesperson, you have heard of an elevator speech. That is considered to be the 30-second sales pitch that you make if you find yourself alone in an elevator with somebody who is your customer or potential customer. And, you know, you may be going to the cafeteria, and you get on the elevator, and uh, you step on there with the director of accounting or the VP of accounting or the CFO, and, and there's nobody else on the elevator, and you've got 30 seconds between floors to say something important to further your own goals, you can say something stupid about the weather, but if you would use that time to your advantage, you may want to say something that would get their attention and that would heighten the impression in their mind of the biomed department. One of the things uh, to go down this list, um, is uh, I would start out by letting them know that monthly budgets can vary widely, especially if it only represents a small part of the hospital equipment. I maintain that this is the number one reason that departments sign service contracts. Radiology signs service contracts because how in the world do you maintain, how does the budget the month-to-month -month budget look for maintaining a CT scanner. If you're paying for it out of your pocket, it's low, 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 high, low, 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 low. And that high month will represent when you lose a tube. So then accounting is going to ask the radiology director to account for that um, fluctuation, and they don't want to do that. They don't like to do that. 
they're not good at doing that. That's not their job. They want to avoid it. So they say, hey, I'm going to sign a service contract, and I'm going to pay the same thing every month. And, yes, it may be more overall than, than it would be if I paid the real cost every single month. But what the heck, I can sign it and forget it. It's the same every month. I don't have to explain it. We need to control outside service vendors. In order to do that, we have to control the dollars that are paid to them. Biomed must have a unified budget that includes all maintenance costs for all medical equipment, including laboratory, radiology, and radiation therapy. Whoa, you might say, I don't maintain radiation therapy. I don't have anything to do with that. I can't even spell radiation therapy. Never been in the area. Why should I control that? Well, guys, you are professional service managers, and if by just the mere fact of transferring those contracts into your budget and having you administer those contracts, the cost of that service is going to go down. Those vendors will treat you as their uh, hospital contact differently than they will treat the manager in that department. Um, oh, we do need to let them know that training and travel for Biomed can be as much as 5% of our total annual budget. 5% of the total annual equipment maintenance budget might be training and travel for us. How many people in your uh, have had your training budgets cut? Well, the next thing uh, on here is we need to let people know, especially accounting, that training and travel for Biomed is different than for everybody else in the hospital. A few years ago, I was running a department, and I had a $270,000 a year training budget. And all of a sudden, administration came to me and says, um, we, well, administration did say I got, a, got a, uh, an email from accounting and it went to everybody in the hospital, every manager and director in the hospital, and it says, effective immediately, we're not doing any training or travel for the next year. And so I immediately went to my boss, Vice President of Support Services, and I met with Dwight, and I said, what do you think I said? I said, but we're different. Guess what every single other department in the hospital came and told him? But we're different. And he did not respond. He did not react. I did not get my budget back. And he was prepared for me to say that we're different and our training and travel is different than for other people. I couldn't understand how they could do something so stupid because how we certainly could not maintain the newer, more expensive technologies without training on that technologies. And how could they possibly be so ignorant as to not allow us to be trained on it? Because by definition that we figured out a couple of slides before, we're the cheapest people on the planet to service medical equipment. And if we can't do it, you're going to have to pay somebody more expensive to do it. So why prevent us from doing it? What I finally found out, it took me two years to do this, guys and gals. After two years, or during the two years, I finally figured out that Biomed, the, bio, the medical equipment maintenance budget in a hospital is only about 1% of the annual operating budget. 1%. We're a very minuscule part of the overall budget in the hospital. And so the hospital, in order to cut funds, uh, well, one thing about training and travel is that the majority of training and travel is for hospital directors and physicians and and people who are pretty high up in the organization to go to professional conferences to um, rub elbows with their uh, particular uh, counterparts. Uh, it's like a biomed director going to Amy. Well, if a biomed director doesn't go to Amy for a year or two, what's it going to do to the department? Not a darn thing. It's not going to impact them because what they learn at those sorts of things uh, or, or outings tend to be the softer things. They may have a payback, but they're not the hard skills. You can't guarantee before you go that you're going to find something that is going to um, be, be useful and is going to save money. So the accounting department 
in consult with administration, decided that in order to save a boatload of money, we're just going to not let anybody go to conferences for next year. And that's what the memo really meant, that it and what it said. It said every training and travel budget. And unfortunately, Biomed was caught in there. After about a year and a half, I got to uh, finally agree, got administration to agree that our training and our travel in Biomed is different than everybody else. We took my $270,000 and we put it in a whole brand new line item in the budget. And this line item was called biomedical training and travel. And it was different than the hospital wide budget for training and travel. And I was told by my boss, if you ever see any memo come across, any edict about training or travel, do not pay any attention to it because you don't have any training and travel. You've got biomed training and travel, and it's different, and it's forever and ever removed from the overall hospital line. The time to carve your training and travel budget out into a separate line item is going to be before they try to freeze your budget, not after, because after it sounds like you're just trying to um, cover your tracks and recover from a loss. The sixth thing we want accounting to know is that we are the least costly maintainers of medical equipment on the planet. We want them to know that overtime for biomed is the norm. For general biomed, it's usually in the range of about 10%, and for imaging engineers, it's usually in the range of about 15%. We don't work overtime because we want to. We work overtime because things break when we're not there, and we have workloads that are that, that, that flex, and sometimes we just have to get the equipment up and running because people are depending on being treated with that equipment. Here's a very, probably the most important thing to let accounting know, is that Biomed must be able to stop payment for capital purchases if we do not certify that the purchase is, is fulfilled to our definition. What that means is we need to know the single person, and in every size hospital, it's one person over in the accounting department who pays the capital payments. You pay for those capital purchases. And the reason there's usually only one person is there's not that many. There's you know maybe $10 million in a year, and so you have one person who handles making sure those payments are getting done. You don't even need an official policy. You call up and you talk to Mabel or whoever it is over there and you say, hey, I, uh, I, I need to let you know that from time to time I may call you and tell you that one of our capital uh, equipment suppliers has not delivered everything that they promised and I'm going to ask you to hold the payment for them. Well, how do you think, how do you think accounts payable is going to act for that? Or, or when you ask them that. I'll tell you from experience, they're going to be delighted because in reality, accounts payable's job is to not pay out any money. Keep that money in the hospital's bank account as long as possible. And if you can help provide accounts payable with a reason to delay payment, they're going to love you for it because that's how they're measured is on not paying bills, holding it as long as possible, paying it the last minute. Uh, we need to let them know that we are 110% for the hospital, and unlike most departments, Biomed is ready, willing, and able to go above and beyond its core mission to help the hospital. This is unusual, guys. You may not realize it because we live it every single day, but I don't know of another department in the hospital that is so willing to go above and beyond what they do. Have you ever been in your shop and gotten a, mess, uh, gotten a phone call and the phone call starts out? Well, I know you normally don't do this, but, and that's the sign that somebody has figured out that you are the go-to people. You're the ones who will, who they can turn to when they don't know where else to go, uh, and that you will uh, exceed your responsibilities to help them out. Um, do you think they ever make that plea to IT? Do you think they ever make that plea to the maintenance department? No, sir. We're the only ones who get that call. 
if those other departments got that call, they'd probably say something like, eh, call Biomed. Here's a couple of strategies. Know your budget inside out, because whenever you talk to accounting, you're going to get down to budget. In accounting's mind, your budget is your business plan. It is a reflection of everything you plan to do during the year. It all has a cost, a dollar value, and knowing your budget uh, basically lets them know that you, you, you know what you're spending money on, you're a good manager. That's the only way they evaluate your management ability is how well you stick to your budget. Having emergency plans for additional ways to save the hospital money. Hospitals get in binds, and you always have, I'll guarantee you, each and every one of you have got plans to expand your department, to take over a service contract, to add personnel that you feel like have not, you've not been allowed to do in the past. But as finances change, as, as budgets change, as health care itself changes, things that you weren't allowed to do in the past, you will be allowed to do in the future. So don't forget about them. Keep them there, and as the hospital is looking for additional ways to save, roll them back out again. We're going to revisit that accounting. Uh, uh, make friends with the person who services your department. You're going to have some concerns. You're going to have some things that are posted wrong. You're going to have some numbers that you can't explain in your budget, and you're going to need to be able to go back to somebody in accounting and, and sit down with them and get them to explain what's going on, why did this show up, why did this other number show up, where's that credit I was expecting, that sort of thing. Discuss beforehand your needs and strategies. Get them on board before you embark upon a a strategy, a new program, a new plan, an expansion. Get their input. Um, it's better to have them on your side than for the first time they hear about it to be when you send in a budget or your VP is talking to them about something. Try to carve out biomed training and travel to be separate from the rest of the hospital. Very, very important. If you don't want it to get, get cut along with everything else, you got to have it protected. Questions or comments about uh, accounting in general? OK. I'm going to push on. This is administration. The ladies and, and, and gentlemen in the, white, in the suits who uh, look like they know everything, and they're the pretty boys in the front office, boys and girls. Though quite often, we might think they're sort of just a bunch of monkey sitting up there not really knowing what's going on because they're trained differently than we are. They don't understand what it is we do, and they have different goals than we have. They are specifically the upper management of the hospital, and they provide leadership and strategic directions to ensure continuity and targeted growth over time. Administration is there to make sure that not only do, do things work today, but that we're in a position that the hospital can survive tomorrow. So they've got to look at a much longer time horizon than we're looking at when we're looking at can we get something fixed in the next 15 minutes before the patient gets here. How they see the world, it's a bunch of performance metrics. How we're performing as compared to our competitors in the area, are we growing? Is our financial position getting better? Do we have money in the bank? Can we weather a storm should it come? Function of administration. Administration, you know, they, they, they oversee all of these things. I think the most important are they got to find patients. They got to find physicians. They got to manage the money. They got to make sure they got enough nurses. A big part of a hospital is space planning physical space to provide services. And unfortunately, certain functions in a hospital have to be located close to other functions. You've got to have a CT scanner in the imaging department close to your emergency department. You can't have it down on the other end of the building. So there's a lot of very complex things that go on in a hospital in figuring out who is going where, what, what departments are going to go where, what you can do. And we're not always going to understand those. Areas in which we'll deal with administration. We'll report to somebody in administration. 
they will be our primary budget approval. We'll go in with our primary budgets, with our initial budgets, and discuss it with our, 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 our person in administration. We will run our capital equipment through them. They will be the first ones to tell us whether we can expand our department or not. Can we embark upon a new program? Can we hire additional people? Can we um, cancel contracts? Of course, we're going to interact in regulatory compliance. <clears throat> and we may uh, interact and, and uh, be allowed to do some equipment installation to save some additional money for the hospital. Ten things every administrator in a hospital ought to know about biomed. This is something we need to beat into their head every time we, we meet with them. We are the least costly maintainers of medical equipment on the planet. There's nobody who can take care of the hospital's medical equipment less costly than we can. They need to know it. They need to believe it. It needs to be part of their core belief. <clears throat> They need to know that job satisfaction of our highly technical people is primarily met by technical training. The surest way to lose your biomed staff is don't train them. We identify with our technical skills. And if our technical skills start getting old and dated, we're not going to be very um, uh, feel very comfortable in our positions. And I've seen a lot of people leave jobs and go to other employers just for, just for the training opportunities. <clears throat> Again, we need to let them know that training and travel for biomed is different. They should go into, uh, uh, they should know that biomed, uh, training for biomed should be the, about the second or third largest expense right behind payroll and maybe parts. We ought to spend a boatload of money training our people. Biomed training is different than any other, and it cannot be delayed or reduced. Any delay or reduction uh, will uh, cost the hospital money. Let me stop for a minute and ask you this. Has anybody ever gone to administration and asked them, said, I need this, given them a, a, a request for training and says, we really need this training? And administration says, no. Well, then what do you do? When I talk to most biomeds, they say, oh, well, we go back and we figure out a way to take care of it anyway. Well, you just proved to your boss that you're a liar. First of all, you said you needed the training, and then you do the work anyway without the training. You just proved yourself to be a liar. And if you'll read uh, my articles, I uh, wrote some articles that says you are a liar, and it talks about this very same thing. You cannot, if you tell administration that you have to have something and they do not give it to you, you can't go ahead and figure out how to work without it. If you could do that, you should have done it before you came asking for the stuff. If uh, Let me tell you a quick story. When I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, working at a hospital down there, I made uh, went to administration and told them we need to hire another person because we're just so busy. We cannot do anything else. We can't put anything else on our plate. We're just so full we can't do anything else. I laid a requisition on his desk for a, like a $40,000 a year uh, technician. He said, nope, we're on a hiring freeze. We can't hire anybody. I said, oh, okay. So I went back, and what I ended up doing was I put every single piece of equipment that came out of warranty on a service contract. Now, I mean every piece of equipment. We were a Space Labs telemetry house. We had Space Labs telemetry everywhere. We had several people trained on Space Labs telemetry. We had all the parts and frequency analyzers and everything for the Space Labs telemetry. Guess what? I started putting individual transmitters on service contract with Space Labs as they came out of warranty, even though we had a lot of the same identical units that we were maintaining. Because as soon as I told him our plate is full, we can't take on anything else, I had to stand by that. So we'd have a little six-bed telemetry system come out. I'd put the whole damn thing on the contract with Space Labs. And that went on for everything that came off of a service contract. The one thing I did, or came off of a warranty. 
So one thing I did is I made sure that on each and every one of them, I was able to secure a 30 to 90 day out clause for no reason. I didn't have to give a reason. I could just cancel at my discretion. So after about six months of this, I had a stack of about $90,000 a year in service contracts that we were paying out. Well, I rewrote out my requisition for a $40,000 a year technician. I walked back to my VP's office. I laid the two stacks on his desk, one the tall stacks of service contracts, not proposed service contracts, not future service contracts. These are in place, active right now service contracts that the hospital is paying every single month. And I said, here's $90,000 a year and they'll continue forever. Here's a $40,000 a year person if you will sign for the $40,000 a year person, I'll make these $90,000 a year contracts go away within 90 days. Guess what? He signed the service, uh, the requisition for the new person. You've got to play the game. You can't let your boss prove you to be a liar. And if you tell him you need some training, you've got to stick by it. Number six, we need to let them know that our computerized maintenance management system is the key to our departmental operations. It generates, it captures information and generates reports that are useful for the entire hospital. Include some of these reports to your boss, let them see. We probably do better data collection than anybody in the entire hospital. We have equipment records that go back years and years. We have PM records, we have automated scheduling, we have a lot of information. We don't let our bosses know what they are. But one, the main reason on this is I want administration, I want you to realize that you need to get administration to spend whatever they have to on the front end to get you a good CMMS system. Because if you got a bad one, you're going to hate it every month, and you're going to hate it every day, your data entry is going to suck, you're not going to be able to get your PMs out of it, you're just, it's just not going to support you. On the other hand, a good one that's set up right, that does what you need for, as far as getting the data in and getting the data out is going to be just just so, so great. So invest whatever it takes on the front end to get a good system. I think we need to let them know that in the area of equipment maintenance, manufacturers are not the friends of the hospital. For maintenance, they would like all of us in Biomed to die to go out of business and let the manufacturer service every single thing in the hospital for two and three and four and five and six hundred dollars an hour. And no matter what the manufacturers say, they do not want us servicing their equipment. They do not come in offering service contracts and on-site training and all that sort of stuff. And without some sort of pressure or belief that they have to do it, they won't do it. We need to let them know that we care about the hospital, the costs, the patients, the staff, and the equipment. We need to let them know we're 110% on the side of the hospital. Whether we work for an ISO, an outside organization, or, for, or directly for the hospital, our number one concern is the hospital. We will, if we're forced to make a decision that's either in the best interest of our ISO employer or the hospital, we will make the decision on the side of the hospital every single time. That's the, that's the cloth we're cut out. And we need to let our boss and administration know that we have to control outside providers, and in order to do that, we've got to control their dollars. A couple bonuses here. We need to let our boss know that we must have a say in every capital purchase made. And unlike most departments, we will go above and beyond to do what's needed for the hospital. Couple strategies with administration. Meet with them often. Out of sight is out of mind. And I've heard, gone up and talked to some VPs and they say, well, everything's going great in biomed because nobody's complaining. Wrong, that's a wrong answer. You know, out of sight, out of mind. We don't want to be the guys in the basement that nobody ever sees. We want to be there. We want to let them know what we can do. We want to be a part of the daily activities and not just the service department that's down there behind the scenes fixing things. 
We also want to be able to give them regular reports. Whether they want them or not, we have to give administration regular reports. A couple of things that my personal guidelines on these things are keep them short. Never make a monthly report or a regular report longer than one page. A VP I reported to one time, he told me, he says, don't go past one page because I want to flip the page. I don't have much time. I'm going to glance at what's on the front page. You can put supporting documentation behind the front page, but make the front page the entire report. If I see something on there that I question or that interests me or whatever, I'll flip and go to see the other stuff on there, but I don't want to flip four, five, or six pages just to read a report. Give me what's on the front. Invite your, the person you report to in administration to your department meetings. I know some of you are going to shudder at that thought because uh, department meetings can kind of get out of hand. People will speak their mind. They'll talk, talk disparagingly about other people in the hospital. Uh, it can get rather colorful at times. But guys and gals, that's the very thing that your boss needs to see. They need to see how passionate your people are and how little tolerance people in biomed have for those people, or those other people in the hospital who don't take their jobs as seriously as we do. I think that passion is a good thing to reveal to your boss. And we want them to really understand clinical engineering and how it benefits both him, his career, and the hospital. And one way to do that is to, when you get a technical uh, 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 a trade magazine like uh, Medical Dealer or 24 by 7 or BINT or something, and there's an article in there and they feature a department and the department's doing things that you've always wanted to do and they're having success at it. Make him a copy of that and circle those things and put a note or put a post-it note on it or something and say, hey, we've been wanting to do this. This other department's doing it and they're having a success. Can we try again? You know? Or if it's things you've already been doing and somebody else is bragging about it, let him know, say, hey, this other department's being featured for doing this. Hell, we've been doing that for five years. So you can let your boss know in very um, discreet ways that you are in touch with what's going on and that you're equivalent to some of the best shops in the country. And we need them to support Biomed's presence on capital committees and on the final sign-off of new equipment and installations. Discussions about administration? OK. Um, let's go to human resources. Not a whole lot about human resources, except that they're going to figure out what staffing we have, what we need. They're going to recruit people. They're going to help us do reviews. And they're going to help us help the hospital not get in trouble for federal employment contracts. Human resources sees the world as people. Lots and lots of people. Everything runs on people. People is what makes it go around. We wouldn't have a hospital without people. So therefore, our job is the most important in the hospital. And besides, we keep the hospital out of hot water with federal employment and equal opportunity employment, discrimination and everything. So we're the, we're, we're the tail wagging the dog. We're, we're the most important. And they are involved in a lot of different things, many different things. And you can see some of them on this, this little description here. But where we interface with them is basically going to be job descriptions, pay scales, promotion of staff, recruiting, annual reviews, and overtime. <clears throat> um, let me say a couple things about promotion of staff. Has anybody in the audience ever sent somebody off to training school and they come back and they've got a brand new skill that is really, really valuable to the hospital, and you come back and you say, hey, I want to give this person another dollar an hour raise because they're valuable and I don't want to get them uh, hired away, and they're worth it to us. And human resources, the first thing they'll ask is, are you promoting them to a different pay grade, to a different job description? And you say, no, they're still a BMET 3. They're just able to do more. And administration will say, nope, you're not getting any more money because we're not in the habit of giving people more money for doing the same job. And in human resources' eyes, 
a job description defines your job. And as long as you're in the same job description, you're doing the same job. If you've only got one job description in your hospital, and that's for BMET, and everybody in your hospital is a BMET, and I saw one up in Saginaw, Michigan the other week, and they had uh, 12 biomeds, and all of them were pay scale biomed. Some had been there over 30 years, some had been there for three years, but they were all in the same job description, they all had the same pay scales, and they were all very, some were near the bottom, some were near the top, but they were pretty much the same. My recommendation is build yourself as many job descriptions and career ladders as you possibly can in your biomed department. Have six or seven or eight grades of bio, of BMETs. Have BMET one, two, three, specialist, supervisor, uh, senior specialist, whatever you can think of, and write accurate job descriptions to tell what those people do. And then when you send somebody to a training class, <coughs> You don't even need to say you want to give them more money. You want to say, hey, they now meet the job qualifications for this next higher level, and I need to move them to this next higher job description. Administrate or human resources on their own will come back to you and say, oh, you're promoting them. Well, they need to get a 4 or 5% pay raise then. It's automatic in the minds of HR that if you move somebody to a higher tier, they're going to get a few percentage points increase in pay. You don't even have to ask for it. But I see so many biomeds, they're in a little two-man uh, biomed department, so they only have one or two pay grades in there, and there's nowhere for either of them to go. Well, I think you need to have seven, eight, or nine different job descriptions and pay grades and scales, even if you've only got a one- or two-man shop because you're preparing for the future, and it also is giving yourself places to move upwards. Uh, let's talk about recruiting. Boy, uh, HR is pretty much useless as far as recruiting. Unless you're a huge operation, you're not going to get a whole lot of, they're not going to be successful in recruiting. Your recruiting is going to be done by word of mouth and other people. Um, Ten things I think that you need to make sure the HR director knows about biomed. Our profession is made up of highly specialized people. We're not cookie cutter and we're not interchangeable. They're used to dealing with and they do the best job when they can deal with large numbers of similarly functioning people. And in their mind, somebody who mows the yard is similar to somebody else who mows the yard and you can unplug one and plug the other one in. A cook is equal to a cook. They do very well on that. Look in your own biomed department. There is nobody in your department that you can pull out and stick another person in there without some sort of impact. We're different. We have different skills, different specialties, and they do need to realize that. That we need to evaluate these unique skills very carefully. The right person can save the hospital tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in excess of their salary. Recruiting efforts are, are almost useless, and that's a fact. And the pay ranges are not useful for highly unique people. If you get somebody who is a CT service engineer, and, he, and he's making, say, $100,000 a year, and he quits, or she quits, and so you start looking around for somebody to replace this TC, CT service engineer, and you find a guy who uh, retires from the factory, this is the guy who made and designed this unit. He knows every part in it. He wrote every procedure about servicing it. He knows every source for every part in the thing. He can do things with this thing that your other service engineer could not even begin to think about doing. But he's still called a CT service engineer. So you may need to go to HR and say, hey, this guy is really, really, really good. He's a real unique person that we need to get in here. We need to pay him $120,000 a year instead of 100000 Administrate or HR is first of all going to balk and say, hey, they're both equal. They're both CT service engineers. Why is one more important than another? And they just don't get it. But sometimes, in rare cases, that has to happen. We need to let them know that sometimes we have to go outside of the norm to retain highly valuable people. 
Um, we had an instance in Atlanta where uh, Phillips opened up a North American service center, and they were hiring all of the imaging engineers in the Atlanta area, and they were hiring them away from all the hospitals, and uh, they were paying them more. People didn't particularly want to leave, but they were paying them, you know, dollar fifty, two bucks an hour more to go over to their service center uh, or their North American support center. And so I got with the rest, with HR, and we got with the other hospitals in town, and we had to bump the pay grades for all imaging service engineers in the Atlanta market by about two bucks an hour in order to retain our, our good people because it was a game changer. We do need to let HR know that biomed staff are among the most loyal of any employees and that our jobs are 24-7, even though we're hourly employees, we don't mind personally being creative with our hours, with our comp time, and with our expenses. Again, we will work. I've seen many, many biomeds clock out and go back to their shop to finish up something that had to be done. <laughs> no, nobody in any other department does that, but we do. Unlike other departments, we're willing to go above and beyond our core mission. <clears throat> strategies we need to employ is to implement multi-tiered job descriptions and steps, write very, very detailed job descriptions, and then also review, understand the review process and its relation to pay changes. Different hospitals have vastly different ways in which they do reviews, in which people are graded on those reviews, and, in, and, and the ways in which that affects your pay changes. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to work the system backwards to get the results that you need. Questions or comments about human resources? OK. Let's try IT. IT is softwares and computers. They're all the hardware stuff, hardware and software. And they do have a heck of a lot, particularly in these days. They do the electronic health record. They do all the business office, which is all the billing and the patient demographics, patient admissions, collections, all that sort of stuff. They do security, VPN access for various companies. They may do the physical security of door accesses. They do you know, passwords and logins is a big part of their job. Uh, HIPAA requirements, huge things. Uh, billing, accounting, laboratory information system, radiology administration information system, connectivity with physicians, offices, and homes, and then trying to educate everybody on how to use this stuff. It's a very big job. There's absolutely no doubt about it. How IT sees the world? Bunch of numbers. In reality, those numbers should all be ones and zeros, but you get the picture. Areas in which we may interact with the IT department. We're going to have patient care equipment that communicates across the hospital network. We're going to need to access various internet sites, but IT blocks it for us. We're going to have servers that contain programs that we maintain, but they're physically locked up in a, in a, in a secure area that we can't get access to. Uh, we're different in our service, in our hardware and software maintenance philosophy. And I, we're different in our desirability of service contracts. We don't want them. They live by them. If I had to list 10 things that I think every IT director or IT supervisor or IT person needs to know about us, it's like, and these are all obvious to us, but they don't know these things. We're like firemen, 24-7, instant response. When something breaks, we're out of there going to the department because, as we all know, somebody can be dead within four minutes if we're not there. <clears throat> our priorities in our work are equipment uptime, safety, accuracy, and reliability of the equipment. Those are huge. We need to let them know that we know about the operation and use of all medical devices, and we can participate in patient care, and we even train the users to operate their equipment. That's huge. I can't think of anybody else, guys and gals, who knows as much about as much as we do. 
we know the operation of every single piece of equipment in the hospital. We know the safety concerns of it. We know the theories of operation. And in most cases, we can, we can fix it and educate the users how to operate it. That is so huge and distinguishes us from anybody else in the hospital. Fourth, I overstate this one a little bit. Security is unimportant to us. Well, of course it's not unimportant, but read back at number two. It doesn't even make our top four equipment priorities. If we had a choice between a secure system and saving a patient's life, I think we'd take the life every time. IT, on the other hand, would probably choose security, and if they're not enlightened about exactly what happens in a hospital, they're going to come in and say, you know, we, we can't lose this patient data. We need to just shut down the, the, shut down the hospital so we can assure our security. It's, it, we can both learn something. We can both come together. We do need to let them know that we do not operate in rigidly defined spaces, and we'll do whatever is necessary to enable the treatment of patients. Here's a pretty big area. We tend to rely on ourselves rather than on manufacturers. IT, on the other hand, tends to like to have a lot of service contracts and depend on a lot of outside companies to do a lot of things. We don't have that degree of confidence in our vendors. Hardware contracts are not a part of our norm. We can take care of all the hardware. Don't put any of that on a contract. We understand health care and patient care, the ins and outs, the workflows, the patient flows, the uh, nurses' frustrations, all of that stuff. We're very, very comfortable in the patient setting. We're great in surgery. We're great in ICU. We're okay around dialysis equipment that's got all these tubes of blood chugging all over the darn place. IT would freak out in that environment. They're just not accustomed to it. And we need to let them know that we want to work with the IT department, but we cannot do it on IT's terms. We cannot put our, we cannot merge our incoming calls into your help desk and let them be put on a three-day waiting list before we get back to them. We've got to triage them immediately and take them out of the order that they came in. And that's important. And it's a real paradigm shift for an IT department to uh, understand what we do. And we need to let them know that we do know a lot about technology, and we can probably comprehend a whole lot more about the IT than they think we can. And again, we go above and beyond. A few strategies. Educate the IT people about biomed, how we're different, but how we're all working towards the same goal. Develop an understanding of IT's mandates and their business practices and develop a close relationship with somebody who can cut through official policies. We all know that everything gets done in IT by having a friend in the IT department who can, who can do stuff for you. Nobody uses the help desk. Your administrator doesn't use the help desk when he has a problem. He's got a go-to person he can call to get things done around that. You, when you need something out of IT, you don't go to the help desk. You've got your own people to go around. The real things happen in IT outside of their, quote, official policies. Questions or comments about IT? OK. Let's uh, take our fifth and final one, materials management. Again, they are the, they're responsible for the planning, sourcing, stocking, and logistics activities of all materials used in the facility. They're major functions, and they've got a bunch of them, and it's very, very complex. And if you think about it, if you've ever sat in any um, consumables committees where people are trying to figure out what to buy, and everybody, every nurse manager comes to the table with a different preference. Every doctor used this at his last place, used that when they were training, is convinced only this one will work or only that one will work or something. You can't make everybody happy, and they've got an extremely tough job to do but they've got to make sure that everybody's got everything they need at every time of the day. And uh, it's, it's tough how they see the world. We've got a big old shopping cart. We've got all the money, and we're looking for deals. <clears throat> Areas in which we might interface with them. 
sourcing of parts, purchasing conditions for new capital equipment, receiving of new capital equipment, receiving parts, asset control of capital equipment and contracts. <clears throat> sourcing parts. How many of you, your departments have buyers that would like to source your parts for you and say, just send me the part number and I'll go ahead and put the thing on order for you. Uh, tell me what you need and I'll get it for you. The problem is that there's always an additional question that you as the technical person need to ask. Uh, so we have a conflict there in many cases. We do have to have our purchasing conditions for new equipment. Uh, let's talk about receiving new capital equipment. Has anybody ever uh, requested or required as a part of the condition of sale the um, uh, service manuals? And the fact that when you get service manuals in, uh, sometimes you'll get a nice, crisp, shrink-wrapped uh, notebook, and it says service manual printed on it. So somebody puts it on the shelf, they mark off and say, hey, we got our service manual. And then all of a sudden, uh, a year later, when it goes out of warranty, somebody says, oh, I need to know something about this. And they pull it open and open it up. And lo and behold, there's only the manufacturer's 1-800 service number in there. There's no service information whatsoever. Well, that happens. And that's the reason that we need to check in capital equipment and evaluate it and make sure we got what it is that we need. Ten things every materials manager needs to know about biomed. Number one, we have many just-in-time needs. In fact, almost everything we do is a just-in-time need. We have many one-off needs. We have things that we've never bought before and will probably never buy again. And those are the things that materials management does not handle very well. They handle the fact that you have to buy 50,000 monitoring electrodes this year and you buy them every single month, and it's the same thing. They have stock numbers, they have part numbers, they have routine sources, they have regular deliveries, they have all of those things. We don't have the pleasure of any of that kind of stuff. One-time, one-shot deals are not unusual. We'll, like I said, we will buy things that we've never bought before and that we've never bought again. There often isn't time to go through the normal channels to set up new vendors or to bid something out or to wait to get all the paperwork in line. We've got to get the damn, it's, it's 5 o'clock in the evening, everybody in materials management's gone home, we've got something down, there's only one of them <coughs> like it in the United States that we can get by tomorrow and we've got to do whatever we can to get the darn thing in here and materials management uh, policies be hanged. We've got to get our job done. Needless to say, we in Biomed often risk our job by breaking hospital policies in order to, to, to do our jobs. This one's important. Read it very carefully. Just because we cut deals or sometimes buy from our friends doesn't mean that we're unethical receiving payoffs or stealing from the hospital. I firmly believe that some materials managers think that since we buy stuff from so many unusual sources that somehow or another we're getting payoffs for this stuff. And I'm ready to just tell them straight to their face. It's not. It's just the nature of what we do, and every biomed shop has to do that, and it's the nature of a break-fix operation. We have things that break. We need to let them know we have to be a part of every capital purchase. We need to let them know not to sign any point of sale maintenance agreements. There's a reason that companies push so hard for the point of sale maintenance agreements. They want to get the maintenance agreement in place before us, the professional service managers in the hospital, even though the equipment is coming and have a chance to negotiate. We need to let them know that our terms and conditions must be a part of every capital purchase and that Biomed must sign off before any final payments are made on any capital purchase. And again, we need to let them know that as far as service is concerned, manufacturers are not the friends of the hospital and they will do everything possible, withholding information, withholding passwords, withholding manuals, withholding anything that they can in order to keep us out of the business of fixing their equipment because they want to do it profitably. 
And unlike other departments, we're ready, willing, and able to go above and beyond. A couple of strategies. Read your purchasing policies. I ask most people, and most people have never read the purchasing policies. A lot of times, if you read a department's policy and procedures, you can use those policies and procedures against them. The policy and procedures say <coughs> it's where they've put down how they're doing business. And chances are they're not following those policies, and you can call those in and, and, and cite those to get things done. Likewise with capital equipment policies. And once you read their policies, if they're not supportive of Biomed, negotiate modifications into their policies and procedures that will meet your needs and benefit the hospital. Develop uh, standard terms and conditions regarding training, passwords, manuals, etc., And be sure to insert out clauses in all contracts. One quick thing about out clauses. Every service contract or every contract has an out clause in it. The out clause is, is called one that's for cause. And the out clause says something like this. If you have a, if we are negligent in our delivery of this <coughs> contract in some way, as soon as you notify us in writing of all of the ways in which we're negligent, and give us 30 days to correct those things in which we're negligent. If we don't do that in that time period, this contract will be canceled. I would uh, ask anybody in the audience who has ever gotten out of a contract for calls to raise their hand or jump up and down. It just doesn't happen. If you have, first of all, we never get around to notifying them in writing. And to, and to specifying in detail what the problems are. And then it's a really stupid company that can't fix those things that you notify them about in writing within 30 days. Nobody ever escapes a contract for calls. It just doesn't happen. So you need to get another out clause put in the contract that says we can cancel this contract in 90 days for any reason or no reason, which means you don't have to give any reason for the for the for canceling it, you just do it. Takeaways. In every encounter with everybody in the hospital, emphasize how Biomed can support the organizational goals. You're not hiring a person to make your department bigger. You're hiring a person to save the hospital money. Remember, Biomed isn't the biggest, the baddest, or the most powerful, so we have to be creative dealing with the other departments in the hospital. I would like everybody to, uh, uh, you know, what you can do is watch Tech Nation and Biomed Talk, contribute to the BMET Wiki, visit my blog periodically, and if you have any questions or comments or suggestions or disputes or whatever, uh, there's my email, there's my phone number. Please let me know what I can do to, 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 to improve this. Questions, comments, or jeers, whatever you have. Years, yeah. Well, it, we're we're unmuted. Yeah. I don't know. Unmuted now. Yeah. Hey, hey, Pat, who's who all's on the phone? I know that we have five of us here in Boise now. Um, it looks like um, Carol Wyatt hung up, and somebody named Bob hung up, and I'm, there's I'm named still Bruce. here. Yep, that's me. I'm oh. still here, Pat. Hi. Oh, actually, okay. I, good. Hi. Actually. Hi, I actually I do have uh, two questions to ask you. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, my first question of the two-part question is, um, it really talks with the full CE, uh, clinical engineer, biomed, and IT, um, like types of training and certification and roles. And I'm just kind of wondering, what is your take on that? What kind of certifications should I expect my guys to start uh, looking into? Well, obviously, I think you should be starting with, um, you know, A plus, network plus are, are big ones. But the best thing right this minute is to uh, the, federal, the United States federal government is offering free online 
training through any one of about 40 community colleges around the country. They're correspondence courses, and you pay $360 to attend this course. You, uh, upon completion of it, the government sends you back your money on the thing, and they give you a certificate that allows you to test for the CompTIA Healthcare IT certification. Cool. And what it is is the uh, federal government has determined there's not going to be enough trained people to fully implement healthcare IT over the next few years, so they've instituted at their expense uh, this training program. What I would suggest you do, I've answered these questions for a lot of people. Uh, the best place to find, uh, rather than me give you a lot of different sites and things to do, is um, go to my blog that's listed on the screen. And when you go there, uh, it's got a search thing. And put in uh, the search phrase you want to put is high tech, H I T E C H, one word. And that will return all of the articles I've written about this. And there's about four or five of them, and it tells you in detail where to go, what to look for, how to get a hold of the, uh, how to identify the uh, community colleges, and uh, how to go about signing up for those. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, my next question, Pat, for you is it's about um, FTE management. And I was just curious to what you thought about, um, do you ever foresee, like, uh, biomeds, especially, like, managers and stuff? I know it's... It's almost nearly impossible to actually assign a specific uh, man hour per device, but do you ever think that or foresee uh, there ever going back to like an average hour per device to help streamline uh, how many FTAs we should have per hospital? A absolutely. I think that that's a, a, a necessary requirement to get us in the ballpark. Um, I, I will tell you that, um, you know, it, it's really dependent upon what you're doing, how much you're doing. Um, you take a hospital that, that has a lot of service contracts, they don't need any FTEs. You take one that has no service contracts, they need a lot more FTEs. I do know that back there was an AHA guide that was published in 1979 that had PM procedures for every single piece of equipment in the, uh, uh, in hospitals at that time, and it was a system that we had actually originated in Charlotte, and it was actually written uh, by Bill Short, who was a, an Air Force trainer, and um, it actually had exact man hour times assigned for the maintenance and for the and for the repair of every single piece of equipment in a hospital so that when we assign them into our inventory, it would come back and tell you you're assigned not just the number of PMs, but the number of PM hours that you were assigned per month. And it really worked very, very well. And I think there's a big opportunity to start collecting those numbers. And I think the big big users, the big ones who have the big databases. Um, Aramark has a huge database, millions of pieces of equipment. Um, uh, Catholic Healthcare Initiatives has three has 300,000 pieces of equipment, and they track all the information for all of their service people. They could go in there and say, of their 17,000 infusion pumps that they have on their system, here's the average amount of time it takes per to, per PM and the average amount of time it takes to repair it, and we could get good numbers from those those big organizations like that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions at all? No, sir. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for your attention. I hope you're all not sitting there uh, listening to my presentation in your underwear. No. no. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Pat. We enjoyed your uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. Bye yeah, now. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.